my message is really something to the effect that, you know, sometimes uh, we need something, something to get us going, something to push us. My heart was weak, and the doctor said there's only one remedy for you, and that is to have a pacemaker put in. And that's going to keep you going. I pray that the message this morning will give you hope and will give you uh, uh, something that will help you to keep going, especially in times of uh, sorrow and, and despair. For surely we can see that in our world today. I'm glad to be up here because it is truly an honor. Uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to because, you know, every time we have a guest speaker come in, whether the DS or whoever it is, on Sunday morning, someone always takes that person out to lunch. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> oh, just teasing. I always like to start a little bit with a little humor, and that was part of the humor, by the way. But as we were having the offering uh, a while ago, it reminded me uh, of a story of a man who was in dire need of money. He needed $3,000. So he said, uh, Lord, if somehow you find it within your grace and power to see that I receive $3,000, this is what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to give 1000 to the sick. I'm going to give 1000 to the poor. The other 1000 I'm going to keep 500 for myself to take care of things. The other 500 I'm going to give it to you. But not long after that, an uncle passed away and left him $3,000. What a stroke of luck. His prayers have been answered. So he received $1,000 and he had it in his hand and began to say, all right, let's see. $1,000 to the sick. <coughs> I haven't been feeling very well here lately. So I think I'm going to adjust the sick but I'm going to keep that $1,000. <coughs> The second thousand is going to go to the poor, right? Uh, I can't think of anybody that's poorer than I am. I'm going to keep the second thousand dollars. Now, 500 is mine already, uh, as I said. Now, Lord God, the other 500 dollars is yours, and I'm going to give that to you next time I see you. That's it. I mean, that's the story. That's it. Oh, well, I should have left that out. Good morning. This is truly an exciting time in the life of our church. Our pastor, Tim, is getting ready to retire. At the annual conference this past week, he was recognized as a retiree. And we must be, we have to be, even though he's leaving us, we must be happy for him. Because after serving the church and being a superintendent for years upon years and traveling back and forth, uh, it's time to retire, as all of us do in our, from our secular jobs. He's going to now be able to be home with his wife and see to her needs and take care of situations that need to be taken care of and, and just enjoy life and maybe travel. And as we know, he, he and his wife like to go to gospel singing, so he'll be able to do that. So we have to be happy for him, even though he, he's leaving us. In looking and what he has done, and what we have witnessed, we, we, we have to imagine that the Lord is saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Well done. Well done. 
It's also an exciting time because we are expecting a new pastor. And it's going to be a little different because you see, the pastor that we're going to have here is, is, is not Native American. But that doesn't matter because as long as he is a believer, as long as he preaches the gospel, as long as he cares for his flock, that's exciting for us. And if you were here last Wednesday and got an opportunity to listen to your sermon, you're going to find that he preaches a little different. He didn't use a microphone. He didn't never stood behind this pulpit. He was down, down there. We can, I guess we can expect that from our pastor. But our pastor also tells us that there are going to be some challenges for this congregation because you see, he is very big on evangelism. He was telling us how he went to loose their jail to visit the prisoners. We do that every Sunday, though. We go down there, we'll visit, right? Uh, once a month, maybe, we'll we do that. But believe me, he won't drag you out there one of these days to be ready. He also said that he likes to visit nursing homes. But we don't want nobody in nursing homes, so why, why should we care, you know? But you better be ready for that too. He says he's very, very big on Bible study. He believes in the actual Word of God, he says. And he likes Bible study. So in a few groups that have Bible study, you can expect him to be there. And we look forward to that. It's going to be an exciting time this next year. It might be a little different. We may, he may not be able to lead us in the Choctaw song, you know, like Brother Tim, you know. But he's going to pick those up pretty quick, I'm sure. <coughs> I didn't know, I, 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 I got the wrong impression of his name. I've been calling him Johnson. He said, no, 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 it's Jackson. So don't do, don't do what I did, okay? <laughs> I believe it's J.B. <coughs> J.D. Jackson, just remember that phrase, Jewelers best, J.B. J.B. Jackson, that's his name. So we're looking for that, uh, that time that, that we're going to be experiencing beginning in July. I want to thank Pastor Thames for giving me the opportunity to fill the pulpit this morning. There were, I don't know, but I heard that there was planning to bring in some outside person from outside the church to come to bring the message. We have, I don't know how many, 10, 12 lace, lace servants here in our church. Pastor says, no. He says, uh, we have lace servants here. And somehow or other, he said, let Rudy do it. Let Rudy do it. And I'm thankful for that, and I praise God for giving me the opportunity to be here behind this pulpit. I have two brothers. Both of them are retired pastors. And my brother from California was here this past week, and uh, we had a lot of uh, uh, gatherings with my brothers and my sister and my mother uh, and, and when I told them I said you know I've been asked to bring the message this Sunday and they looked at me do you have your sermon ready? They said I'm working on it I'm working on it they said but I need some feedback from you professionals I finished my sermon and I showed it to my younger brother who just retired this uh, uh, a year ago, really. He looked at it, he said, I only have one suggestion. He said, what is that? Change the title. Change the title. So the title now goes from 
the compassion of Christ to Christ's compassion. Christ's compassion. You heard this text this morning. I have this little booklet that has scriptures that are being coming out of the book of Luke. And I looked at it and I said, I like the way these scriptures are written. So I want to share this scripture with you. It comes from Luke chapter 7, verse 11 through 17. You heard it read earlier. He says, next, after Jesus was on his way to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd accompanied him on the journey, when he came near the gate of the town, look you, a man who had died was being carried out to bury. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. There was a great crowd of past people with her. When the Lord saw her, he was moved to deep, to the deepest of his heart for her and said to her, don't go on weeping. He went up and touched the briar. Those who were carrying it stood still. Young man, he said, I tell you, rise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And he gave him back to his mother. And all grieved them all. They glorified God, saying, A great prophet had been raised up among us. And God has graciously visited his people. This story is about him who went out in all Judea and all surrounding countryside. The scripture for this morning. Amen. Amen. There are, I looked at it and I said, you know, I see about three, maybe four sermons in this text. I said, I wonder if I could just kind of group them together into one. You see, I, I see a sermon where God, through Christ, always seems to be at the right place and at the right time. That in itself is a sermon. The second thing is that there was sorrow in the loss of a loved one. There he is. There is Jesus. Another, another topic for another sermon. The next one is kind of, is really what I'm trying to emphasize on this particular, this morning, was that he said to the woman, weep no more. Because you see, in this can also find a message about a time to weep. And everybody has cried. I have cried. We've all have experienced this. Well, I'm a man. I don't cry. You cry. You cry. That in itself is another. Finally, the last part that I thought could make a good sermon is because Jesus raised that young man because you see, Jesus is the giver of life. He is the giver of life. Not only physical life, but we're talking spiritual life, eternal life. He is the giver of life. First, verse 13 
16 says, When the Lord saw her, he was moved to the depths of his heart for her and said, Don't go on weeping. And in many ways, it seems to be that this is about the loveliest story in all the Gospels. Don't go on weeping. So in this message, we will see, we will see how we encounter Jesus in times of our need and in times of our sorrow and in times of happiness. As I said, I have changed the title from the Compassion of Christ to Christ's Compassion. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that you, Spirit, gives us guidance in the message this morning. May the message give you honor and glory. Amen. About two or three weeks ago, I attended a funeral of a, of a friend of, of, uh, of ours, especially me, and, and because there's, there's a five of us that uh, for the last few years we've gotten together and we have always played golf together. Uh, we're all running about the same age. And uh, there's five of us, and one of our golfers, I wasn't playing that day, but I was told that while he was on the golf course, he collapsed and just fell for no reason at all. He didn't trip her, he just fell. And not long after that, it happened again. This friend was uh, a retired school teacher. Uh, he now has found time to enjoy life and go out and play golf and enjoy life. So he went to see the doctor and because this is rather unusual just to simply be walking out on the golf course and all of one just collapse. Well, he got the news and was diagnosed with what they call Lou Gehrig's disease. The muscles began to deteriorate. So he couldn't play golf anymore. As time went on, he began to feel more and more deterioration in his legs, and then he was on a wheelchair, and uh, then he began to uh, experience the same thing in his, in his arms. Uh, he only had movement in one arm where he could operate in a wheelchair. The last time I visited him, we was in good spirits, and, and still laughing, and, and talking about good, good, our good times that we had and moved around with a full chair with one hand as he controlled it, as he had no use for the other hand. The next time I asked one of our friends that lives nearby, he says, well, how is he doing? He said, well, he's constantly deteriorating. Now he is being fed through intravenously because his muscles are now no longer functioning. And I got a call about three weeks ago and said, Steve, passed away. So when I inquired about the services, uh, and I was told when it was, and, uh, and so I went to the service at this, it was a Catholic church, and I encountered the other four, other three rather, that played with us. So we all sat together because our friend and our fellow golfer was now in a casket. And we sat there and we talked a little bit about him, about his good times, about what he did, and, and how we we're going to miss him, and, and so forth. But, and we sat there and we listened to the service. People would get up and, and give him accolade for what he did, and how he was, and his, his family, and so forth. And there was laughter because some of the things that he did, and, 
and there was also a time of quietness because, uh, and there were tears that were being shed. We all have experience, even here in this church. We have had several funerals here. My friend Rob, Buddy, and others, Larry Larn, and all those others that were had passed on. And at every single, every single funeral, there were tears that were shed. There was sadness that was felt. The loss of a loved one. We have found comfort in our Lord and Savior. We sing the hymn that tells us that the God of the mountain it's the God of the valley. In times of sorrow, He is there. In times of the good times, He is there. But the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley in the bad times. And we mustn't forget that. Jesus encountered a, a funeral procession as He was going down the road with an entourage and His disciples. And Jesus, uh, he always seemed to appear at the most unexpected times. We, uh, he was going to, this, to the ancient city and he was walking by and, and there he saw a crippled man sitting by the pond, a pool. And the man had been sitting there for who knows how many days waiting for someone to help him into the pool that he might be healed. And Jesus shows up at the most unexpected time and tells the man, get up. The impossible thing. Get up, you're crippled, but get up. <coughs> but the man did it anyway. He got up. We see him showing up at the most unexpected times. He showed up at the well one day to, to refresh himself and there he met a woman and this woman was kind of, what, what are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. You two don't associate with us. Don't matter. The woman, you need help. I'm going to give you water so that you'll never thirst again. Somehow Jesus always seems to come at the right time, at the right place. You and I have experienced him too. You, you say, well, what did that think? Because you and I have done the very same thing. We have experienced him at the most unexpected times. Maybe it was a, in the time of our loss of a loved one. Maybe it was a sickness. Maybe it was a crisis within the family. In this particular encounter, and Jesus was going down the road and he sees this funeral procession. In this particular encounter, encounter, a young man's body is on the way to be buried. His mother, who was a widow, was loudly weeping. The emphasis, for some reason or other, the scripture let us know that she was a widow. In other words, she had no husband, passed away. And this was her only son. We just read in 2 Kings, didn't we? About the prophet who came to the house and gave me something. He said, well, I, I, the woman said, I, you know, I'm a widow here and, and all I had just enough flour for myself and my only son. But he does, she does what he tells him and, and, and she is multiplied with her needs. But then again, you see, after a while, the son became sick. It was her only son, and he became sick, and then all of a sudden, he died. 
And the prophet Elijah comes and says, you know, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. For Elijah, the son, her only son, came back to life. The scripture said, and he gave him back to his mother. He gave him back to his mother. In our scripture, the plight of this widow back in those times was really hard because if there wasn't a husband or a male in the family, the woman had no really no means of support. She just couldn't go out and work somewhere. So really, this woman was already very dependent on her son for her well-being. But I don't want to emphasize that all she wanted was to survive. That's what she wanted. But this has to understand that this was her only son. Without her son, she had no one. She had no one. There was no means of support. The lot of her, uh, uh, of, uh, of a widow in the years was, was very hard. Her dependence was not on, on her, uh, was only on her son. When the Lord saw her, he tells us, he was moved to the depth of his heart. I don't know that we can ever understand or ever feel how he must have felt that day when he encountered this woman. But going to say to the depth of his heart, it must have been a very painful and very uh, 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 compassionate care for this woman. John Wesley, John Wesley's most often quoted phrase is, I felt my heart strongly warmed. He trusted Christ for his salvation and he trusted Christ for his assurance. The warm heart is a wonderful part of our Christian heritage. And it comes from trusting in God through Christ. The warm heart. You know, my brother came from California. He and I had been communicating to, uh, by phone several times. He used to call me just about almost every other day. Asking me, how are you doing with the pacemaker? How are you doing? I know you have to go back in to do this. How are you? He constantly calling me and asking me how I was doing, you know. When he came in Sunday afternoon, I got to my mom's house. He called and said, I'm here. I kind of got a little bit of that, you know, warm. My brother is back in, back in town, my younger brother. My younger brother that I used to push away and over, just overwhelm him with whatever I wanted to, you know? He's back in town. He's a retired pastor. And I was proud, proud of him. And I felt that warmness. And we went and we saw him and we visited, we hugged and we talked. I think I can understand a little bit of what Jesus might have felt. That, just a little bit of it. Christ said to the mother, don't go on weeping. You know, we... He said, that's kind of harsh, isn't it? Here is a, 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 a mother who had just lost her only son, and she is in sorrow, in pain, and Jesus tells her, don't go on weeping. It's kind of harsh, isn't it? You know, he was telling her, when you stop your weeping, 
everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be all right. Remember that. After you're weeping, after you stop, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. In Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes, uh, we find in chapter 3, verse 4, it says, there is a time for weeping and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. It's okay to weep in times of loss of a loved one, or in times of sorrow, we read in the scriptures that even our Lord and Savior wept. Even he wept. When he said, don't go on weeping, he was telling the mother, everything is going to be all right. It's kind of hard for us at times when we're going through the suffering and pain of loss of love or whatever it is, he says, and, and, and we're feeling the sorrow. How can people tell us it's going to be all right? Just, well, you know, how can, you know? But if Jesus tells you it's going to be all right, you can take that to the bank. You can believe it. Because sure enough, things will turn out okay. I see my friend back sitting at the back pew there. He went through some crisis some time back. He was in the hospital. He was on dialysis for a while because, you know, they thought that maybe he was, you know, something that happened to his blood. I went up to see him, but at that time he was gone for some tests, so I missed him. I left him a note. Later on, as I, I heard that. He was being released. He was being released. Pastor uh, Eddie and I went to visit him and we took him communion. That was on a, I remember on a Thursday or Friday. The next Sunday he was in church. Everything's going to be all right, he says. Don't worry about it. And there he says today, back to work. Everything's going to be all right. Don't go and weep into the mother, he said, because everything's going to be okay. Things may look gloom now, but tomorrow is another day. I shared this story with you not long ago, especially with the children, about a rooster who, who uh, had to run on the barnyard. He was a big, strong rooster. You remember the story? And how he used to press around, you know, and all of a sudden one day uh, the storm began together, the sky turned dark, and the storm was coming and the wind was blowing, and it got to the point where it was just so tremendous that the rooster couldn't stand it anymore, so he ran into the little chicken coop. And the wind and the storm and the lightning and everything was coming around him, and all of a sudden the whole chicken coop collapsed on him. And all through the night, there was not a sound. Just the rain and the thunder and the wind. Early next morning, the skies had cleared. The sun had shone through. And there was the collapsed chicken coop. All of a sudden, there was a little movement under all the lumber and tin that was laying on top of it. And he worked and went, and out came his head. And he looked around. Everything was calm. The skies were clear. The sun was shining. So he worked himself out of all that mess that he was laying on top of him. And he came out to the middle of the barnyard, and he, he spread his wings and fluttered around and began to say, cock a doodle doo cock a doodle doo What he was saying, it's a new day. It's a new day. There's no more storms. Everything is okay. It's a new day. Jesus is saying to the woman, 
Don't get weeping. It's going to be a new day. A new day. I uh, <coughs> he was telling her really, and when he, not to cry anymore because Jesus was there now. He was there. I heard the song from uh, Freddie Fender. Everybody know who Freddie Fender is? He sings a song about who used to be his girlfriend and now she has gone and left him and has taken up with some other and, and he says, if, if this guy or this man or this person ever does you wrong and leaves you in tears, he says, I'll be there before the last teardrop falls. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus says the same to the lady. Lady, you go ahead and cry, but your tears will, will cease. And I'm going to be there before the last tear drops. I'm telling you, if that's not hope for you and I in times of crisis, I don't know who we can go to. I'll be there before the last teardrop falls. Verse 14 says, He went up and he touched the brow of the stretcher. Those who were carrying it were still still. Young man, he said, I tell you to rise. And the dead man sat up and he began to speak. How do you think his mother must have felt? My goodness. And then, he tells her, he gave him back to his mother. We just read in, in, in 2 Kings, we lied to the prophet after bringing the son back to life, he also gave her son back to his mother. I tell you, rise, and he arose. And he gave it back to his mother. Luke 9, 14, we read that Jesus removed the demon from a boy and then gave him back to his father. Jesus is in the life-giving business. He is in the life-giving business. Jesus claimed for life and led <clears throat> Jesus claimed for life and led those that have been marked for death. He also claims it. Jesus is not only the Lord of life, he is the Lord of death. He himself triumphed over the grave and who has promised that because he lives, we shall live also. John 3.16 says, Everyone who believes in him shall have eternal life. No more death. No more sorrow. I guess out of those four things, I, I like the best when he says, Don't go on weeping. One afternoon, I received a phone call from one of my friends who attended church here. Well, there we go. Once in a while, attended church. She was crying. She was crying that so sorrowfully that I could hardly understand what she was saying. I mean, I have a hard time hearing it anyway, but. Then, with all the crying and carrying on, I could hardly understand what was going on. But it seemed that she had just gotten back from the doctor and seen the results of the test. And from that test, it was found that she was, that she had cancer. 
We pray over the phone. All I could say was to trust in the Lord. Have faith. She was still crying, but go ahead and cry. Uh, I, I, if I'd have read this much earlier than then, I, I would have said, you know, he will be there before your last trip drop falls. Go ahead and cry. He will see you through this crisis. The cancer was removed, and she's been taking treatments. He comes to the church uh, every, every once in a while. One day she showed up. It was good to see her with a big smile on her face. No more weeping. No more weeping. Just trust me in the Lord. New life, new hope. He gave her her life back. He gave the widow woman, the mother, her son back. He is in the life-giving business. <laughs> you have trouble with your life? Call upon him. He will take care of it. <clears throat> you lost a loved one? You're going to see that one again. You'll see that person again. He gave her back to her. Praise God, he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we can all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is in the life giving business. Go ahead and cry. Go ahead and share tears, the loss of a loved one or some sorrow. <coughs> Remember, he says, everything is going to be all right. It's going to be okay. And we can rely on that. I want to thank you for coming out in this middle of this rain and all of a sudden the, the sun is shining after all the storming. We can be like the rooster. It's a new day. It's a new day. And it's going to be a new day and the life of the church when the new pastor comes. I want to warn you. He is a doer. You better be ready when he calls you. Let's go down where the homeless are. Let's go down to the jail. Let's go down to the nursing homes. You better be ready to go. Only then and we have life that God wants us to enjoy life. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to bring this message this morning. I pray that somehow or other uh, we have come to the understanding that in the middle of whatever situation we may find ourselves, we know that you are there. We can cry. We can shed our tears. But in the year, we know that everything will be all right. We have that promise. We ask your blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. We pray this in your blessed name. Amen. Amen. Amen.